Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you. Listen in right now. Thank you for letting us in your ears, Jim Hart, Logan Larson, Mike Akins, and brand new patron, Casey. Everybody welcome Casey. 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 Welcome. Welcome. On this episode of DTNS, Ron Richards from Android Faithful tells us what to expect from Google's Pixel announcement on the 13th and why Google leaks so much ahead of time. Uh, Plus, I think declining iPhone sales might be good news for Apple. I'll explain. And the music industry is fighting AI. They're fighting mad at AI, and the AI's fighting back. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 2nd, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the mean streets of New York, I'm Ron Richards. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. It is wonderful to have you along, Ron Richards. Thank, thank you. you for being here, and thank you for doing Android Faithful. Oh, my pleasure. And and it's a delight to be here to get out of the 90 degree sweltering heat here in New York because it is a uh, it is uh, a desert, post-apocalyptic desert here now. So, yeah. There, there there must be a term for when New York and Los Angeles are the same temperature. It's like it's like parody or whatever. Yeah, 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 it's exactly, that it's yeah. some inflection point in yeah. the year, but uh yeah, 91, 91 yeah. right now oh, according to the old watch. Uh shall we begin with the quick hits? We shall. Intel announced it will reduce its workforce by 15%, more than 15,000 people over the course of 2025. It's also cutting marketing, R&D spending, and capital expenditures. Q2 revenue at Intel was down 1% on the year, and the company lost $1.6 billion. Intel's PC and server business is profitable. The losses are driven by new foundry business, which makes chips for other companies. Meanwhile, Intel is pushing a code fix for a voltage problem in those 13th and 14th gen CPUs and also extending the warranty by two years for a total of five years from purchase. NVIDIA has grown big enough to catch the attention of government regulators. U.S. Department of Justice is investigating NVIDIA's acquisition of Run AI. NVIDIA acquired Run AI in April and the company virtualizes GPUs letting a customer to do more things with fewer chips. So, with NVIDIA having 90% of the market for high-end AI chips, the U.S. Department of Justice would like to see if maybe they're trying to stop anyone from using Run AI and reduce the demand for chips. They're also investigating allegations that NVIDIA overcharges for networking products if a company decides to buy competing AI chips. Uh, France's regulatory agency is investigating the dominance of NVIDIA's CUDA chip programming software, and it's not... Just NVIDIA. Just before the show, the U.S. Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, the Dream Team, have filed a lawsuit against ByteDance, accusing it of violating the Child Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPA. Uh, the suit accuses TikTok of collecting data from accounts created in kids mode, intended for users younger than 13. TikTok has a previous agreement not to do things like that, made by Musical.ly, which many of you may remember back in the day, ByteDance acquired and merged into TikTok, so TikTok has to abide by what Musical.ly agreed to. Well, Google blinked, or folded. Maybe it blinked and then folded, but it has decided to pull its ad that featured a dad using Gemini to help draft a letter from his daughter to Olympic hurdler Sydney McLaughlin Levrone. A Google spokesperson told The Hollywood Reporter, while the ad tested well before airing, given the feedback, we've decided to phase out the ad of our Olympics rotation. Uh, similarly, Apple has pulled the fifth installment, pulled rather, the fifth installment of its short film, The Underdogs in Thailand. People were complaining it made the country look underdeveloped. Apple had used a Thai production company to develop the ad. Uh, don't say anything. That's what I've learned from these two stories. The Sixth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals has delayed implementation of new rules by the FCC that would classify Internet service as a telecommunications service, not an information service. ISPs brought a lawsuit over the rule change, and the court has scheduled oral arguments for late October or early November. If you're like, wait, what? This is net neutrality. The new net neutrality rules are being challenged in court, so they don't go into effect until the case happens. Each of the U.S. major parties reclassifies the Internet every time it gains control of the FCC. It's a fun little game. The government of Turkey has directed ISPs in the country to block delivery of Instagram. Instagram has about 50 million users in the country who now must use a VPN to access the service. The government didn't state a reason for the ban, but newspapers in the country claim it's because Instagram was removing posts expressing condolences for the assassination of Hamas leader in Iran. 
Apple reported Q3 revenue was up 5% on the year, despite iPhone revenue being down 1%. So hold on, isn't the iPhone the big revenue generator? How could they have revenue go up while the iPhone was down? Well, services. I've been saying this for 10 years. Apple's pivoting to services. Eventually, services is going to catch up. Services revenue was up 14% year over year. Uh, if you don't know what's in services, it's a lot. It's Apple Music, TV+, Plus, Fitness, News, iCloud, the App Store, <laughs> Google Search revenue. It's all in there. Uh, iPhone revenue was $39.3 billion. Services revenue was $24.21 billion. So not passing iPhone, but still starting to get within the ballpark, right? Uh, iPhone makes up 46% of the company's sales, after all. Meanwhile, Apple also got an assist from a 2% rise in Mac sales and a 24% bump in iPods, iPad sales with the new iPads out. Uh, and about half of the new iPad sales were first-time buyers, not upgraders. So that's interesting, too. Uh, those are both smaller markets, though. Macs and iPads each made up about $7 billion of revenue each. Uh, but I don't know, Sarah, what do you think? If I say this is good news, yes, iPhone is down 1%, but it's only down 1%. Uh, yeah. And we're you know getting close to the new iPhones coming out in the autumn, seeing that you can have a 5% revenue boost based on services and Macs and iPads seems like good news. It does. I mean, obviously, Apple does not want any sales to decline. They don't even of want course. iPhone sales to be flat. I mean, they want everything to grow. <laughs> All companies want this. But yeah, the point of services at one point being like, all right, we're going to get into some services. You know, 10 years ago, Apple's services um, uh, you know, arm of the company was pretty small. And the company has been pretty vocal about wanting that to grow. And like any, I don't know, smart investor, you want to diversify if you can, because if you put all your eggs in the iPhone basket and the iPhone, you know, the the, the wind uh, shifts, then, then you get into a, a big issue. I'm also impressed by the iPad sales, up 24%. I mean, there have been quarters and even years where a lot of us went, <laughs> is iPad really long for this world? And it sounds like for, you know, a variety of reasons, especially with new buyers, uh, the iPad has, 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 has reemerged like a phoenix from the ashes. So, so yeah, I think that this is, this is really positive for Apple overall, especially because we're going to go into a quarter with a bunch of new iPhone sales. So I think those numbers are going to look uh, a lot different in Apple's Q4. Yeah, I feel like iPads, they sell well every time there's a new iPad. And the fact that it's half first-time buyers means everybody holds on to their iPads. And so yeah. people don't buy new iPads unless there's a new iPad that catches their eye and like, oh, maybe I should finally get one of those. Ron, you're in the Android universe looking inside uh, of, of Apple from the outside. What does this look like to you? Well, we still follow on all this info about Apple over yeah, yeah. Faithful. But um, I actually have three thoughts. First, I'm, I agreed on the iPad sales. I'm buoyed by the fact that anybody who uh, watches or listens to Android Faithful or All About Android, our previous show, knows that I've been saying it's the year of the tablet for the past five years um, because I just feel like the tablet is such a great form factor and can do so much. And it's great to see those sales kind of rising no matter whether it's Apple or Android or not. So I'm um, buoyed by that. Um, we look at the trends of phone sales quarter to quarter across Apple, Samsung, Google, all of them. And what, and this is, I don't have the data in front of me, but what I've seen, you know, conversationally since the pandemic has been a softening of the market across all the uh, manufacturers uh, because it just seems like people aren't buying new phones as often as they previously did. There was the, you know, the new one every two years or things like that. And what we're seeing, at least from the numbers we see on the Android side, is that people are holding on to their phones a little longer. And also the fact that, that we're getting longer service, you know, uh, support of security updates and things like that. That kind of goes to that where people are getting more dollar out of their phone purchase and not getting one every uh, new one every year. Yeah. <laughs> um, last, my, the last thought I have on the services side is I'll tell you what service isn't helping, and that's Apple TV Plus because nobody's watching that platform at all. So, uh, <laughs> but it wins awards, Ron. It I wins know, so yeah. many awards. It's, I mean, when yeah. you look at the Nielsen numbers, Apple TV Plus is like it's it's smaller than some. Yeah. Uh, it's laughable. It's, I mean, I love Slow Horses, best show, best show on the platform, but um, nobody's watching it. So. Apple, I'm uh, watching the, it. Uh, well, we are. I don't know. But, yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, Presumed Innocent got some good numbers. That was great. Wasn't that good? That was such a good summer show. So, yeah. really nice, was, yeah. uh, nice. Ap apparently, it was a Harrison Ford movie, and I had no idea. Um, <laughs> Apple's biggest problem, though, is China. Uh, Apple saw a revenue drop in China, 5.7%. Every other region grew. 
Uh, they have problems with Apple intelligence goosing sales there because you can't use OpenAI in China. So they're trying to work with local partners. Uh, they're also trying to plug a loophole in WeChat that lets you do external payments without using Apple Pay uh, through in-game messaging. WeChat doesn't want to plug it. And Apple probably doesn't want to kick WeChat off their platform because if Chinese users have to pick between WeChat and Apple, they're going to pick WeChat because you can't do anything in the country without do using WeChat practically. So uh, there's that is probably the bad news is that there's a lot going on in China that is very challenging uh, for Apple. And that, like Sarah said, you're going to get good iPhone sales after the new iPhone is announced. What happens in China over the next couple of quarters is going to tell you a lot about the future of Apple. Generative AI music startups Udio and Suno both let you create music using text prompts or uploading a, a music file as inspiration or a combination of both. And depending on what you're going for, you can achieve a finished product that sometimes sounds a lot like a song that already exists. So it's not a big surprise that both companies have been sued by Universal Music Group, Warner Music Group, and Sony Music Group. All three uh, started a lawsuit back in June claiming, hey, you're illegally scraping copyrighted materials from the internet. However, this case is a little interesting because in separate court filings yesterday, neither Udio or Suno denied that they were doing this. They said, yeah, it's no secret. This is Suno. It's no secret that the tens of millions of recordings that Suno's model was trained on presumably included recordings whose rights are owned by the plaintiffs. But they said it includes essentially all music files of reasonable quality that are accessible on the open internet. So you might say... <laughs> Okay, well, what's your defense? Fair use. Sudo says it's allowed to make a copy of a protected work, part of a back-end technological process, to make a new and non-infringing new work. In its filing, Udio writes, the premise of their, meaning the music label's case, is that music styles, the characteristic sounds of opera, jazz, rap music, are somehow proprietary. Decades of ju ju judicial precedent establishes that no company controls a genre or a style of music. Now, the RIAA, which actually initiated the lawsuit, doesn't agree. Huge surprise there. They say there's nothing fair about stealing an artist's life's work, extracting core value, repackaging it to compete directly with the originals. And also says, Suno, Udio, all they had to do was get consent. Other companies had done it, and we wouldn't be in the situation. This is uh, this is going to be pivoting on fair use, uh, and I, I've I've made a, a career out of trying to learn fair use, but I'm not a lawyer, so I'll do I'll do my best at interpreting this. Uh, what the companies are saying, I think, will hold up in court for the most part, which is we are not copying the music, uh, we are making a transformation of it. One of the defenses in fair use is, is it a transformative use? If it is, it might be fair use. They're transforming it into something else. That is very clear. Copies of the songs are not kept in a database. They train a model on the songs, and then they don't keep the songs. Right, uh, and no song is, that, that gets generated includes a sample of an original, um, which is, you know, historically Unless it does by accident to, to or something, right? Unless it does by accident or something, yeah, uh, it also doesn't. Uh, it also doesn't undermine the marketplace for the original songs, uh, in except in so much as it creates other songs. But it's not illegal to create other songs. You're not under marketing, undermining the marketplace for the original itself by replicating it. Uh, so I think they've got a pretty good fair use defense. The problem for me is that people don't like that they train off of copyrighted work. Even if fair use allows it, people don't want it to be allowed. And a lot of the companies like OpenAI get that and are licensing works anyway, just to be safe, because this is unsettled law. But that's why I keep saying what we need is a law that reflects public sentiment and says it is not fair use to train a model uh, on copyrighted works without permission. Because I think yeah. the biggest question, the biggest question here is it pushes the definition of derivative, right? And it, and and to your point, it's not copying or it's not using. We hope or we think, but I know you know coming off of you know the my experience and work in the art industry and comic book industry, we've seen generative AI models output artwork with artist signatures from the what the source was, what they trained on. You as can part make of it do that, output. but that's pretty rare. No, I mean it, it happened and a, a lot. And it's it's not because there was a copy in the database, right? right? It's because it was able to do that. That you could you could filter for that right. stuff too. And they should but 
and it's getting better and it is getting better. But I think also like this is the, the AI, the, the deals between the entertainment companies like the record labels or the RIA, which is representing the artists themselves. Um, this was a big sticking point in the strike in Hollywood last summer uh, because all of the, the, the actors are, are concerned about taking my work and sucking me into an AI and you're going to replace me, right? So there's a fear amongst the artists that this is going to replace me. And if you can make a Taylor Swift-esque song, what value does Taylor Swift have at that point, right? And that's where I think a lot of that fear comes from. I do think that the precedent of OpenAI and other companies going and getting uh, agreements to make it okay to train on copyrighted material works against them because people are doing that. They're, that is seen as the up and up kind of way to do it versus, oh, just claiming fair use. Um, so, you know, I don't know which way it'll and, go. And but. again, there's, there's legal and then there's what people think is fair, right? Yeah. The, the, which yeah. are two different things. Uh, we'll, we'll see what the lawyers say. And you're right. Der you could make an argument that this is a derivative use that is not authorized. Uh, and that, that is something that has a lot of precedent, but I think most courts are probably going to look at this and go, I don't know, y'all, they're not keeping a copy and they're making things that are different. So yeah, you can make the the tool make a copy but if you stop it from doing that is everything else it's doing wrong probably maybe not uh which again is is why i think you need to add to the copyright laws these copyright laws aren't in the constitution they were they were passed by congress uh and and so you can amend them easily and say you know uh there is no fair use defense for training a, a model on copyrighted works you have to get permission for that which it seems like that's what everyone thinks needs to be done Except well, for the AI yeah, and the subject of, you know, what most people think is right and wrong in the situation is a really gray area. If Ron is a wonderful pianist and I say, you know what, Ron, I really want to like a theme song for my new podcast that's like sounds like the opening theme of Succession. But maybe we like add some violins instead of, you know, all piano. And Ron goes, yeah, I got it. I, I know what you're going for. He makes something different song. Nobody cares, right? It's right. just a, it's a, it's a, it's a feeling. It's a vibe. But if I say into, uh, into Suno or Udio, make song like Succession theme song, and that's in there, and it's very obvious that that's what I'm going for. I wonder how those two um, end up, you know, playing to 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 the folks making these decisions. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's interesting because there's a difference between a genre or a style. Make, do me a jazz song or do me a song that sounds like John Coltrane, right, that, off of a person. But what has happened is that we've seen artists like on the art world, like Roy Lichtenstein has become a style of pop art is synonymous with his name. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so, like, it's just, it is just fraught with so many potential potholes and landmines that people, folks can step into. And it's really dangerous, I think, because you don't, we don't have transparency into what these models are doing and how much they're pulling from it and you know i'm trying to come up with some sort of metaphor but it's like if tom if i took one of your books and cut out each word and then rewrote a new book with the words from your book but it's a new book is that okay even though i use the words from your it's book it's a transformative right? use right, right? yeah yeah and so, it's not uh, undermining the marketplace for pilot x or, or triggers yeah, right yeah. so yeah it's legal would it make me feel weird maybe yeah, yeah. and i think i think that's what we're dealing with is people saying uh i don't think this should be allowed uh but unfortunately, the law didn't contemplate this particular use case for it before. So. Well, yeah, this is where the technology is outpacing the law yeah. by like leaps and bounds, and it's going to take years to sort this out. So. Uh, well, that's why I suggest you take your mind off all of it by watching my top five about hats. Uh, I have a lot of hats. Uh, a lot of folks in our audience talk about all the hats I had. We even had a hat tournament to determine my best hat at one point. Uh, and so Zoe Brings Bacon, our social media manager, said we should do a top five your favorite hats. So that's what I did. Uh, it's it's a break from the usual. I count down my top five favorite hats. You can find it at youtube.com slash Daily Tech News Show, at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, or DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram, and see what is my number one hat. What is the top hat? Google's Pixel 9 hardware event is scheduled for Tuesday, August 13th, but details about the new Pixel phones are out. You know, everyone knows what they are. In fact, Google even is the leaker. Like, not even, not, they're not even leaks. It's just Google saying, like, yeah, it's going to be this ahead of time in some cases. Uh, the most recent leak came about the Pixel 9 Pro Fold and the prices and the release dates and all of that today. Uh, Ron, let's talk about, like, what has been leaked out there so far? What have, what have been 
people have said. Uh, and and then we could talk about why does Google seem to leak the most? I mean, Samsung and Apple get leaked ahead of time too, but it always seems like Google just everything, like every single thing is known ahead of time. But let, let's start with going over what we know so far. Yeah, so a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff has come out, um, and and I always hold the, the optimistic side of me hopes that so uh, uh, when Google has their event on August thirteenth uh, in Mountain View, the Made by Google event or or MBG as it was referred to when I was at the Google office last week, they're like, "Are you going to be at MBG?" I was like, "Yeah, I'll be at MBG," um, <laughs> but um, uh, I always hope that there's a surprise or something that didn't get leaked or something like that. But so far, the leaks have basically given us all of the specs and prices and the lineup of what to expect for the new Pixel um, line of phones, right? So what we're getting, what what has been leaked or what we're speculating that we're going to be seeing, all depends on whether or not you want to believe the leaks or not, is there'll be a Pixel 9, there'll be a uh, Pixel uh, Pixel 9 uh, Pro, which is a little bigger version, and there'll be a Pixel 9 Pro XL, which is a bigger version of the Pro. Um, and they've all got various degrees of specs, whether, you know, they're all, they're all supposedly uh, operating off of the G4 Tensor chip, um, different sizes um, and shapes of the phones themselves, and different you know, camera, you know, cameras and batteries and all that fun stuff there. Additionally, there'll be a, a new foldable. Um, the 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 leaks or the rumors for this uh, show a change in name. Uh, if you remember last year, it was the Pixel Fold, and now they're making they're sucking it into the Pixel Nine, even though there haven't been eight iterations of the fold yet. Um, <laughs> so wait, so my Pixel Fold is just the Pixel Fold. Just it doesn't the Pixel get Fold. A number. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, and then the next one is the Pixel 9 Fold Pro or some, we jumped sort, some from no number to nine. Yeah. Pixel 9 Pro Fold, right? It's basically take the word Pixel 9 Pro and mix them all up in various different orders and you get it. But, uh, <laughs> it's fair um, use. Yeah, exactly. Um, but so they're, they're going to have that foldable that's out there, which it looks as if um, based off the leaks and things that we've seen. And I mean, this is confirmed because Google has released a video showing it off. Um, um, it is, uh, and Tom, if you if you have the original Pixel Fold, they're changing the form factor to be a little more similar to the OnePlus Open, which was still the book style fold, but a little taller than the previous mm -hmm. Pixel Fold. The pre Pixel Fold was a little more like a moleskin, where uh, th this new Pixel 9 pr uh, Fold is going to be a little taller and a little more book-like uh, in that regard, which I like. I like that form factor. I like that, that setup for it. Um, and then there's been rumors that there'll be more uh, uh, Pixel Watch. The Pixel Watch 3 is expected to be coming out um, with various different flavors um, and it's looking like we're going to see two different sizes. Um, they have a, a supposedly, it's been rumored that they have a new technology for the display which allows for a smaller bezel and then also a, a, a larger uh, size from the original Pixel 2 watch. Um, and yeah, and all, it's all going to have Gemini because everything at Google has Gemini now. Um, and yeah, and essentially as far as where the leaks go, um, I, now I get it, Tom. You know that it seems like Google leaks a lot, but I will say from experience, we, the the entire year of announcements from Samsung to Google and everyone in between, we have been able to get the specs ahead of time before the announcement across the board, right through these leaks. Sure. Um, and Google, I don't think Google is any different than Samsung or any different than OnePlus or or any of the other manufacturers. Um, they just happen to be the latest. Like Samsung Galaxy Unpacked a couple of weeks ago, we knew everything like three weeks, to the point, we knew everything three weeks ahead of the show to the point where more leaks came out and we're like, we don't want to talk about this again. We've talked about it enough, right? Um, so why this happens? A couple of reasons. One is FCC filings and other government regulatory filings in other countries. Um, some of those leaks have come from in order to get the devices to be able to sold on the days that, that Google wants it to be sold, they need to file, they need to you know, back it up and file before the announcement comes out. And oftentimes those records are either leaked or public. Right, so um, I know I believe it was in Australia or New Zealand that one of the FCC FCC like regulatory commissions had the information on the watch, and that's how it got out. All right, so public data, public information like that. Yeah, um, and, and Apple is actually pretty savvy at figuring out how to do those filings in a timing and a form that leaks less. Uh, it doesn't seem like Samsung and Google care as much. They're well, like, we're just going to make our filings and when we have to make them. Well, the, and the question is, is that, and and what I assume this is my speculation the gap between the filing and the on sale date and your event right cuz yeah. quite quite often some companies if be it apple or samsung are are perfectly happy to keep it quiet announce it and say and it'll be available in a month or whatever Until, yeah, it might right. be um, Google, I think, because of what they're trying to do in the marketplace and trying to be a little more aggressive in getting people to get on board with Android, get on board board with Pixel, want those phones to be available as quickly as possible. 
Um, and so I think that's why we're seeing the that early makes filings. A difference, yeah. Additionally, you'll see leaks from uh, materials being shared with retailers. They are arming the the Verizon store, the T-Mobile store, the Carphone warehouse, whatever it is, with spec sheets and information, so that when the event happens and customers come in, those sell, sales people are ready to um, provide that information. Which begs the, the the question, and we talked about this in the last episode of Android Faithful. Who cares if the stuff leaks? Right. right? We talk about it. We are a small population of nerds who like this stuff. Right. Most my, people don't care. My yeah. sister, my sister, who's an English teacher who just wants to know when 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 it's time to get her new Pixel phone, does not care what what the specs are two weeks before the event is. She will Which, hear she will hear about it when she sees the ad on TV and go get her new phone. That changes my question. I was going to ask, why does Google not seem to care? Because, again, like the perception you're you're right. The, the leaks are probably about the same across all of the different announcements. But yep. it does seem like Google doesn't even give a crap like they they come out and will follow up on leaks and go yeah that, one, that one's right occasionally well, is it i mean is it, it seems because like they google know? just it seems like google's just benefiting from people talking about the products yeah for, i don't think it's a bad but then why do I, so that's why i want to flip my my question why do other companies care I, I think they're starting to care less. I mean, I yeah. think honestly, because because you're starting to see. So Google started this playbook. I think ever, the pandemic's always my marker, but I feel like pre-pandemic they started it where Pixel stuff got announced and they scrambled and just put out a video showing it, getting ahead of that. And then we've seen instances where they've even gotten ahead of the leaks and just released the teaser video to be like, hey, here it is. We know it's coming, but you're going to hear the rest about it in the event in a month or whatever yeah. it might be. Because they and know the, people will still pay attention at the event. Exactly. And yeah. the speed the speed of which they got these recent videos out to when the leaks came out I mean they they were just waiting or they had them ready right they have they, they've done this enough times and sarah to your point i think you're spot on we're talking about it right we're hyping it up yeah. before the event comes out yeah. um talking about the pros and cons but as someone who wants to be excited at that event and there's nothing better than the the keynote and the speech and all stuff like that give me something that is a surprise give me something that we don't know about like there's rumors of a of a new tv streaming device that's going to come out is that going to be at the event we don't know um is there some other sort of event that might uh, some other sort of product that we don't know about that they could surprise us with um, going back to they 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 employed the strategy with the tablet uh, they announced the pixel tablet months and months and months before it was even on sale and we knew it was coming and it allowed developers to make apps and they did this all this stuff about developing um, software to work better on large screens um, and so that worked in their favor I don't know how the sales were on the pixel tablet but they they announced it well before the announcement point. Right. Um, so I'm hoping there's some sort of surprise or some sort of thing. And then the other aspect with Google, as always with these um, announcements, is the hardware is only one piece of it. The software is is largely the bigger piece. It's what cool AI based thing are we going to get in Google Photos that only Pixel users can use? And we haven't seen we've seen some of that stuff leak, but not enough to be definitive that we know this is coming. Like we've seen, you know, an evolution of Magic Eraser that that going to do other things to allow you to post edit. Um, uh, uh, photos and things like that. Um, that's the stuff that I think Google leans on that they can control because there are no regulatory filings about that. Well, and that goes back to your point earlier about phones becoming a commodity, right? Yeah. You To get someone to upgrade a phone, you need to give them something new. And there's not much you can give them new hardware-wise. Foldables right. is kind of it. So software is that distinctive factor. That's why you see Apple doing Apple Intelligence. And that's why you see Google putting the Gemini stuff on Pixel first to try to encourage people like, hey, you might want to try a Pixel phone this time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we'll see. So the event is uh, August 13th, uh, made by Google event. Uh, I will be there. Jason Howell, Wintwood Dow, and Michelle Roman will all be there in person. Um, we're going to be covering the event, and we'll see how close the leaks were to what is announced. We'll see what surprises there might be. Um, but I got to admit, based off these leaks, it is a strong and robust offering that just shows a continued evolution. They've changed the if the photos, if the leaked photos are believed to be true, which you know, probably they are. Um, they've changed the 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 visual look of the back of the phones. It continue to be distinct, continue to be wholly pixel, but uh, not just the same as as last year's model, right? They've evolved it to a certain degree. They're going more for a uh, isolated island for the camera uh, camera bump on the back of it. Um, but yeah, it looks to be like a pretty good lineup. You know, it, it seems to have a phone for every use case from the Pixel Nine all the way up to the Fold. Um, so yeah, so we'll see what the, what they have for us on August thirteenth. I am looking forward to the surprise, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. I hope there's a surprise. <laughs> All right. Let's take a uh, quick look at the mailbag. 
Jeff had a thoughtful follow-up uh, conversation Justin and I had yesterday about Reddit not liking search engines crawling its data without it uh, without, the, without them paying Reddit. Jeff says, Reddit should sue over this issue, though I hope with every fiber of my being that they will lose that lawsuit with prejudice. I'm no longer a Reddit user, but at one point in time, I consented to a user agreement that explicitly asserted that the content I produced on the platform was mine and that I granted Reddit a non-exclusive license to it. I assumed at the time this was a non-exclusivity extended to this content being scrapable and searchable and usable on the open web. But clearly I was wrong about that. Reddit claims the right to exclude whomever they want from that content because they can then deny others access to their platform. I object to the content being called their data, but at the same time recognize that they have the right to block people from accessing their servers. I'm imagining Jeff and millions of others taking all of their data from Reddit and making it freely scrapable for all the AI crawl bots just to teach Reddit a lesson. It's a fun weekend project. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, it only take a couple hours. Ron Richards, so nice to have you on the show today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I know you're excited about Made by Google, um, and uh, you do Android Faithful every week with the crew, but let folks know where they can find you on the net. Yes, so you can find me. Uh, my personal socials are um, at RonXO, wherever you might be. That's If you type that in, you'll find me. I'm most active on Instagram. You can see the movies and TV and uh bands I've seen live and stuff like that and food and the usual Instagram fair. Um, but yeah, but as you mentioned, uh, I'm one, one quarter of the Android faithful team, um, over at AndroidFaithful.com. Um, we got a, you know, audio video podcast every Tuesday at 5 PM Pacific, 8 PM Eastern. Um, and then over on the website, we're covering uh, the industry as best we can. Um, and we just thank everybody for the support and we love being part of the DTS family. So Yay! Thanks for having me. good to have you guys. Android Yay. faithful is fantastic folks. If you haven't checked it out already, which you probably have, but if you haven't, Go check it out. Also, if you are a patron of this little show, DTNS, stick around because we do extra content every day for you as a way of showing thanks. Today, because it's Friday, we like to have a little fun. So we're going to do a balance game. Uh, so a, little, a little tech balance game. A little this or that. Would you like uh, rather have a pixel or a galaxy? Stuff like that. Stick around. The answers will surprise you. I promise you. 100%. <laughs> You can catch our show live. We do it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. We're back on Monday with Justin Robert Young in the seat again joining us. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host Rob Dunwood. Video producer Joe Kuntz. Producer at large Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods. Beatmaster W. Scott is one. BioCow. Captain Kipper. Steve Guadarrama. Paul Reese. Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso and JD Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Nika Monfort, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Ron Richards. And our guest this week was Brett Rounceville. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>